Joe presents Pioneers, together with Open Money. Financial advice for all. This episode of Pioneers was recorded last year. Since then, Propercorn has rebranded and is now known as Proper. Hello and welcome to Pioneers. My <laughs> guest this week is Cassandra Stavrou, the founder of healthy gourmet popcorn brand Propercorn. She founded that in 2011, and they're available in 11 countries around the world. Last year, the Financial Times called Propercorn the fifth fastest growing company in Europe. Welcome, Cassandra. Thank you. Before we get down to business, um, I am a huge George Michael fan, and I've heard that (laughs) if I were to play George Michael's Careless Whisper to you, there would be an interesting impact. What what, what happens if I play George Michael's Careless Whisper? Uh, So... um... We have well, we have a chef at the office. Um, I think it's really important that you know we uh, some of the best conversations happen over food, mm-hmm. and so we have lunch together every day as a team. And um, the first time we did it, uh, the chef put on George Michael Careless Whisper, and that kind of intro saxophone was almost this sort of cool call to action and um, and then it just became a thing and it's almost like Pavlov's dog now uh, whenever the, t- the team is sort of like you know working around 12.45 and they hear that saxophone and it's literally just like run to the, to the queue. Wrap it up um, and get yeah, to food. Yeah. We talk to a lot of people about this. We, we've, we've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and mm. I'm still trying to discover really many of them uh, talk about the end products right that, that they thought that this was a route to riches and for other people it seems like this was just a way to express their creativity for you what was what was your impetus into this uh i, I guess a few things um my, my family from originally from cyprus mm-hmm. and i think there is something around that sort of immigrant mentality that you know take a risk start a new life set up your own business that um, growing up, I was very much surrounded by that mentality, so mm-hmm. it doesn't feel as foreign to me. Um, and then when I was 16, my father passed away, and um, subconsciously, I guess, I felt that that, you know, I needed to look after my family. Mm-hmm. And um, strangely, I don't know, uh, starting a business felt like the quickest way that I could think of to do that. Was that because your parents were business people or, or is it just you mentioned that immigrant mentality? Yeah, I, th- I think it's kind of a bit of both. Um, you know, no pressure was put on me. Oh, you know, you now need to support your family. But I just think being the eldest child, maybe, or I don't know, you're, you're the psychologist. <laughs> but, um, but I think, you know, I think that's that's when um, it's sort of formalised in my head that, you know, I wanted to start my own business. Mm-hmm. Um, probably when my father passed away. So talk about that. You started, you, you felt you had to take some responsibility mm. for taking care of your family. That's at 16, you said. Yeah. What were you doing then? Oh, I mean, you know, I was I was a lot later on before, you know, Proper Corn launched, um, about eight years later. So um, I guess, you know, everyone has ideas. We're all armchair entrepreneurs. I was doing, you know, at university, I used to run club nights, um, alongside doing my law degree and you know I've always been quite active and opportunistic um, is probably the word I'd mm-hmm. use but you know proper corn was my first kind of serious business. So were you thinking about ideas then you said it was eight years between kind of yeah. your father passing away and you starting proper corn were you even whilst in law school you said you were doing club nights and other stuff mm. were you always thinking of ideas that would? Yeah there's been a whole host of ideas um kind of preceding proper corn from uh, a frozen yogurt company called Yeti, um, a dating app, um, ve- like various, and, and not just within food, just mm-hmm. kind of across the board. And I think the reason I truly went for proper corn was just the coming together of various things um, in terms of, you know, market opportunity, timing, um, a bit of serendipity and... Um, you know, and, and that, it was the perfect storm, I guess. Well, I mean, the perfect storm. How did you know you'd found the right one when you came across this um, idea? Well, so the idea came from uh, an observation that, uh, you know, I was working at an ad agency in Soho, London, and three o'clock every day after lunch, uh, everyone would go and buy a snack and they'd go and buy a chocolate bar and feel really guilty about it or go and buy a rice cake or something and feel really dissatisfied (laughs) and so uh, you know I thought there was an opportunity to create a snack that was full of flavour but didn't leave you feeling guilty and I thought popcorn was a wonderful snack to do because we're all familiar with it it's Mm -hmm. not so niche and abstract you know we've all grown up with some sort of nostalgia around popcorn Um, and so that was the observation the timing felt really right in terms of market trends that were coming through um gluten free low calorie healthy snacking all of that 
and then um, a bit of serendipity in that I went home and I told my mum about the idea and she reminded me that the last present my dad had bought me was a popcorn machine. Oh, that's lovely. Um, and I'd completely forgotten about it, actually, and it was just a... OK, this is the one, you know, that's a good sign. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a good omen. Whatever. You know, I'm not fatalistic, but um, I'll give this one a go. I mean, it's a lovely confluence. I don't, I don't know if we've talked to anybody else who's had that, such a, a, a poetic yeah. tie <laughs> into their entrepreneurial it, it did all just idea. kind of make sense, I guess. And it's a lot more poetic than the idea that you've found something that's the, the, the happy medium between a rice cake and, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and chocolate. But, you know, I think you need both. It's the sort of the heart and the head. It needs to make sense mm-hmm. on both sides. I mean, you mentioned the nostalgia around popcorn and, and you know, I, I think of that and I, there's definitely a nostalgia yeah. around it. There's There's you know, mostly burning it as a child yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in a pan with some oil in the bottom. There's, but then nowadays, I think the, the, one of the few times I have popcorn is is at the at the movies. Yeah. How did you know that that nostalgia would drive people to actually want to? Well, I, I think that was our greatest challenge: is how do you reposition something away from its, you know, you know, the the snack that has sort of grown up in the movie theaters yep. mm-hmm. um, and around film. How do you reposition it as an everyday healthy snack? And that was always going to be our greatest challenge. Um, we were really lucky that um, f- a few big competitors entered the market at the same time, and that's often the case when you create a new category that, you know, three or four people in different times and places see the same trends, the same triggers. And um, I naively was distraught when the, you know, the competitors entered. I went home to my mum in floods of tears. And actually, it's the best thing that could have happened Mm -hmm. because it creates that consumer demand. It means that retailers are more likely to take you seriously. Um... And so, you know, the category grew, not just through us. And, and I think that was a good thing. And then it's then it's your job just to make sure you're the best. Yeah, exactly. And how did you do that? I mean, that's a really simple statement to say. There's lots of people listening in and like, yeah, OK, I have an idea and I want to make sure it's the best amongst a myriad of competitors. Yeah. How do you make it the best? Um, you know, it, it's definitely not one thing. It's a combination of lots and lots of small things that amount to something compelling. So making sure that, you know, your product is, you know, your product is everything. Um, So making sure you've got the best quality product, but then also the brand around it, making sure it's authentic and distinctive. And then the team, um, the team is everything. It's a team effort and bringing brilliant people into Mm. the business is what makes it. Um, So it's certainly a combination of lots of things. Yeah, I mean, how long did it take you from inception of this idea coming home to your mum and, and hearing about that popcorn maker that your dad yeah. had got you to actually being there, seeing your product in shelves? Um, well, t- 10 times longer than I thought it was going to take. Um, you know, I guess if, you, if you're starting a business, you are naturally just quite impatient and you mm-hmm. just want to get it going. And um, what I thought I could do in six months ended up taking the you know, best part of two years. Uh, one of the biggest challenges and hurdles was finding you know, the, the supply chain, the manufacturing side of things, trying to find a manufacturer who um, would take me seriously as a young girl with no proven track record. Um, and just you know, getting the whole host of the parts of the business moving from trademarking to setting up the company to the branding it just takes time i mean there's a huge number of elements there but people yeah. will want to know yeah. how many years was it was it two years yeah, then? yeah from, so think, two years in total yeah to get from inception to product on a yeah about that on a shelf so it's a remarkable amount of patience that's required yeah, I guess so. Um, or were you just not patient? You were just... I think it's probably the opposite. Ah, I think okay. it's impatience. And um, I think you have to have a level of, you know, impatience if you're if you're trying to... You know, the momentum is everything, especially in those initial kind of few years of mm-hmm. starting a business. And so you have to have a sense of urgency about everything. Um, and, then I, and then I started to, I guess, get a bit stale, excuse the pun, and... Um, and that's when I decided to uh, bring a business partner on board and that um, my co-founder, Ryan, mm-hmm. he joined um, along that journey. And it's one of the best decisions I ever made because you then kind of um, create that pace between the two of you. Um, if one of you's down, the other one sort of comes up. And 
Yeah, I mean, how how did that partnership work? Because you mentioned that people were were mm -hmm. this hugely important factor. What was it you saw there with Ryan that would make the difference? Would help you get over your being stale? Mm -hmm. Help you manage your impatience, perhaps? Well, uh, it was an amazing. Uh, piece of advice that uh, Richard Reed, one of the innocent founders, gave mm -hmm. me. I was really lucky to have built a relationship with him where he gave me kind of advice. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, you know, I got to a point where I was feeling really quite low and just a bit flat. And he said, you know, you, you don't have to do this on your own and, you know, understand where your strengths lie. And, and um, Ryan and I had been friends for a you know, great number of years. He was at a point where he was looking to get involved in something and, yep. you know, it just kind of worked. And it immediately creates accountability between the two of you. Yep. Um, whereas it's quite, it's quite, um, I mean, I have so much respect for anyone who's successfully set up a business, f you know, fully on their own, because having to be being accountable solely to yourself and keeping that sense of motivation is really challenging. And so um, the minute there was two of us, it sort of had that even greater sense of urgency. Yeah. And so you've already mentioned that you had a tough time getting certain people to take you seriously. Um, I, d I know that there are lots of entrepreneurs out there who will completely understand that without having been, as you as you said, yeah. a young girl trying yeah. to be taken yeah. seriously by these people. Y those early days were tough. You had a lot of doors slammed in your face. Yeah. So can you talk about some of those and also how you handled that? How do you handle... Yeah. Um, not people not seeing what you see when you look at your idea. Yeah, I think um, y you have to be resilient. Um, that's kind of number one, mm -hmm. and and kind of develop a, th a thick skin. All the cliches, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, the world of manufacturing, particularly, tends to be um, a very male-dominated industry, um, and so going up and down the country, kind of on my own, uh, with no proven track record. Um, Understandably, actually, to, to a certain extent, they didn't take me seriously because it is a bit of a punt. You know, you've got this big operation, you have to sort of pause your line to put me on. Um, but I think uh, I think being a, a girl as well, there was probably a, a bit of kind of, you know, oh, you, the big boys are coming. Oh, dear. Um, that kind of chat. Um, and that just makes me even more determined and you just... You have to find creative ways around those kind of hurdles. Um, so I got um, I got a cement mixer um, to tumble the popcorn, and I was watching Top Gear, and the way that you um, spray paint cars is the you know the kind of finest mist that you can get. And I got a car spraying kit on online uh, to apply the oil, and you know you cobble it together. You're resourceful. You're you like just, the MacGyver of yeah, popcorn yeah, making. You just, you just crack on. Um, um, and find, uh, find a way around it. Yeah, you have to. I mean, <laughs> so cement mixes. Yeah. I mean, really. Because uh, many people would think, all right, I don't know. Does that give me confidence now with my popcorn knowing it was first? <laughs> well, I guess, um, you know, we have a shiny factory now, very professional. Yep. It's still the same principles. It's tumbling something and yep. applying a mist of oil. And, you know, it's the same principles, just professionalized. So, um, and you have to be resourceful. Um, and slightly creative, I guess. I'll be honest, if I were you, I would still have that cement mixer up on a pedestal somewhere. It, it is actually at the factory. Is it really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've still got it. Oh, that's brilliant. We need yeah. to see pictures of that, yeah, I think. That absolutely. would be great. <laughs> What's brilliant about this is being able to talk to people about how they've achieved amazing things. And for you, it's clear that's not enough. You've got more in your mind. Yeah. But you've had to go through these difficult patches. And one of them was the... Uh, the um, you mentioned how capturing nostalgia in terms of branding and everything else mm. is important. And you had uh, a designer of the packaging mm. that I think uh, either didn't quite meet the, meet the brief or let you down. And can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I always um, I always wanted the packaging to be really distinct and uh, I guess a bit more lifestyle than your traditional kind of healthy snacking mm -hmm. cues. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I moved back home. I'd saved about ten thousand pounds. And I spent decided to spend six thousand of that with a packaging designer because I wanted it to be amazing. Mm -hmm. And and actually, you know, he did a great job, um, but it just didn't feel me. It didn't feel authentic. Um, and the closer and closer we were getting to launch, it just something didn't feel right. And so decided to essentially, you know, throw the designs in the bin and start again, which, relative to my savings, um, was a huge decision mm -hmm. um, but there's this thing called uh, sunk cost fallacy where you feel like 
you know, I've, I've committed now, I'm 80% down, down the road, I should probably just see it through. But if there's that gut feeling that's just sort of this isn't right, I would urge everyone to listen to that because it was, you know, the best decision, you know, that we made. And I ended up designing it on PowerPoint and cobbling it together. And my friend who was an illustrator did the designs at the bottom. And it was imperfect, um, but it felt true to what we were trying to do. And, yeah. Um, so I think, you know, all of those challenges that we faced in those early years are actually where we probably learned the most. Mm -hmm. And another one of those challenges outside of the design <laughs> issue was something to do with a meeting at Selfridges. Oh, God, yeah. So um, uh, before we launched, I, um, I'd actually just finished a shift working. I was sort of working evenings and weekends at a pub. And um, I just finished one of the shifts and decided really stupidly to do a backy on a bicycle on my friend's <laughs> bike. Um, anyway, suffice to say, I came off the bike and really severely broke my ankle, kind of in three places, severed my tendon, and was um, in crutches uh, for six months and um, couldn't put my foot down for three of those. So it was, it was just the wow. worst timing. Mm -hmm. um, and Ryan and I uh, got a meeting at Selfridges and it was, you know, a really big opportunity. We hadn't, you know, properly launched yet and we were running late. And so we, um, we just must have been the kind of, I don't know, the, the craziest sight. Uh, Ryan sort of running through Selfridges with me over one shoulder, popcorn over the other my crutches sort of flailing up the escalators and we just arrived in this absolute kind of chaos but um i don't know i think it probably demonstrated our commitment and our passion and and, and we got the gig so um it, it, it worked out in the end i mean multiple <laughs> reasons for yeah. selecting the right person for your partner there yeah Brilliant skills with your business, also and strong, strong enough to carry <laughs> yeah, yeah, you around, yeah, yeah, exactly. which is brilliant. You're watching Pioneers together with Open Money. So, getting you got that gig with Selfridges. Um, how important was it to get uh, access to a brand that gave you that kind of deferred credibility? Mm, that can... so important. Mm -hmm. um, well, Google was actually our first customer, which. You know, who, who doesn't Not know? Bad. Who doesn't know Google? Not bad. Um, and I don't, have you ever been to their offices? Yes, I have. Um, so you'll know they, oh, yes. um, you know, we're lucky enough to, to have a chef. They have, you know, sushi bar, rotisserie, all the rest mm -hmm. of it. And they free issue all their snacks. And I had a friend who worked um, at Google. I introduced us to the head chef. He was willing to, I guess, give us our first gig. And, um, and it was amazing, you know, credible ubiquitous brand that we could then sort of tart around the industry mm -hmm. and then we just became professional salespeople for pretty much two years i mean uh we, you know we, we, you wear all the hats but we knew that getting that distribution and that momentum was so fundamental and so we became telesales door-to-door -door sales leaving no stone unturned and we just were, were selling yeah day in day out I mean, did you ever worry what would happen if, if those connects hadn't happened, if Google, Selfridges hadn't happened? Were they the real key levers for you, or, or did you just think one way or another we'll make it? Um, I, yeah, I, I hope it doesn't sound arrogant, but I, I really believed we could do it, and I, f I felt confident on that. Yep. Um, so if it hadn't been Google or Selfridges, we'd have found another one. I, I, I'm, I'm confident on that. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's amazing. I mean, lots of entrepreneurs have that kind of uh, positivity, will never give up. But, I mean, what would you have done if you'd have gone to, say, the first five of the people who actually did take you on? Mm. And instead of Selfridge just thinking how passionate and quirky you were for coming in over the shoulder of your business partner, they were like, no, thank you. Disaster. What would have been, what would have been the alternative for you? Um, well... I think you have to, if you're getting knockbacks, um, you have to listen to them and maybe reassess, you know, is our proposition right? Is our pricing right? Whatever it may be, something's not working because if your product and everything around it um, is exciting enough, there shouldn't be that much resistance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we were feeling lots of resistance, then I hope that we would have been smart enough to paused and, and kind of tried to sort of tweak it or whatever, whatever any, was required. Were there any of those tweaks you had to do 
anyway, and despite some of the successes you had? Were there any consistent messages you heard that were, whilst didn't stop the sale, mm. were just uh, something that you thought maybe with something we could tweak here? Um, yeah, loads. I, I think um, you have to stay restless and continually evolve your proposition to reflect either a changing market mm -hmm. or um, or the response that you're getting. And so you have to stay really open and close to sort of how, you know, how, the feedback and yep. how, how it's being received. And so, I don't know, um, a good example is we initially, you know, all, all products up and down the country get shipped around in brown cardboard boxes. And uh, we got a major listing with a supermarket, you know, 500 stores, crack open the champagne amazing the reality is that when you're an unknown brand um it's quite often uh, it's, it's typical to get forgotten about in this sort of sea of cardboard in the, st yep. the stock room um and so we thought okay well let's try and overcome that through creativity and we uh, decided to make our brown cardboard boxes beautiful bright illustrative cases so proper luggage almost um which does cost a bit more but um you know, there, there was a direct commercial impact to that, you know, that our compliancy shot up overnight pretty much as a result of the fact that, you know, the, the person loading the shelves noticed us. Um, and it's such a simple thing when you think about it, but it just shows um, the power, well, I think it shows the power of creativity. And was that one of your ideas or was that something that your team just looked at and said, this is how we're going to solve this potential problem? Um, well, well, this would have been kind of when we weren't really a team yet. So it was just so, a couple yeah, of you. Yeah. Um, ruminating on it. It's yeah. remarkable. So I, I wanted to chat. I've got a quote here and I'm always slightly suspicious of quotes that look okay. like they, they belong <laughs> on, on, on the website. <laughs> yeah. um, and it says, one of the real highs I get from owning a business is sharing it with all the team, which is exactly what I think I would love to see every yeah. every founder of a business say, but I'm not sure it's credible with every founder. Is that is that really true for you? No, I'm totally merciless. No, no, it's 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 one hundred percent true. We um it's the thing we're most proud of and it's where we get our kicks from and we celebrate together and we Oh God, I, I, I'm trying to avoid sounding cheesy, but it is a, a, the culture of proper corn. Um, I, I really believe. I mean, it's almost culty. It's it is it's, it's unique. Culty in a good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's really unique, and um, we're only going to grow and realise the potential yeah. by everyone feeling this sense of like ownership, and we're all we're all in this together. Um, and so, it is true. <laughs> so what I mean, it, it's got it's hard to be all things to all people, mm. and running a, mi a multi million pound business. How, what kind of boss are you? How um, would you characterize yourself? Uh, well, can I answer that by saying the things, the qualities I think are important? Yes, please. Um, I think empathy mm -hmm. is so important. If you, I don't know, I I, I think it's. Key, key to being successful is is having empathy um, in every way. Um, how can you expect someone to you know come into work every day, give you such a big chunk of their time, um, without being empathetic to kind of their personal sort of challenges and I don't know difficulties? Um, so I, ho I hope I'm empathetic. Um, I don't like the idea of too much hierarchy, and that's something that both Ryan and I feel strongly about, in that it's about sort of empowering people within the business rather than just telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and this idea of work-life balance, I think, is just a bit funny in that so much of your life is work, so it shouldn't, it shouldn't feel so, I don't know, separate. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know if that answers it's your question. It's, it's hard because I think for many people, if you hit, if a, if a founder, um, the, the, the person responsible for a business first says empathy, there's the immediate tweak of suspicion because we all would hope. I mean, mm. I'm, I'm an organizational psychologist. My work mm. is in this area. I know how much that benefits an organization if they're, it's not about being warm and fuzzy, but if, no. if a person can connect authentic, authentically, it's really valuable. But it, it seems rare out there. So how, in the midst of starting something in an immensely competitive market, 
doing every part of the job along with your your business partner Ryan how do you ensure because now it might be easier perhaps to hold those mm. values empathy and work life balance and all this mm. other stuff but how when you're starting do you make sure that that's at, at your core too when you are just fighting mm. um in some ways, I think it's easier in the early days because it's so tight and, um, you know, there's only a few of you. Mm -hmm. And I think empathy comes from building proper personal relationships, understanding someone and um, truly uh, understanding their motivation and why they're even here, why mm -hmm. they're giving up their time to kind of be part of this sort of crazy idea and so I, I think in the early days it's actually easier in some ways um, as we grow and the business gets bigger and we have a, a bigger team it you have to consciously work hard at holding on to that culture and that sense of closeness and it's just logistically harder to get to know the people that exactly are around you exactly your story is one of of, of lots of uh, down to mm. the up so you think that every entrepreneur should have that kind of that rite of passage where they they are where they they feel that they're scrimping for money they spend the money the money doesn't work out how they wanted it to they knock on the right doors but the doors don't answer yeah do you think that's a really valuable thing um in some ways yeah i do um because i don't know if we'd have had an unlimited fund let's say at the beginning mm -hmm. um i don't know if if, I think when when you have a finite, you know, s smaller pot, it forces you to think strategically. It forces you to uh, be a bit more creative. Um, and actually, as I said before, some of our best lessons came from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, we um, we really naively uh, didn't know, didn't sort of realise. Okay, so you have a six month shelf life on a product. And we thought, OK, well, we've got six months to, to sell this. Let's just order a load. Mm -hmm. um, and then we kind of very quickly realised that supermarkets expect a minimum of four months uh. into their store. And so what we thought we had six months to sell, we only had two. And it, and it quite literally could have bankrupted us, you know, within a matter of weeks. Um, and that pressure forced us to just sell even harder. And that just kick-started this amazing pace in the business so I don't know if we if we hadn't had that pressure maybe we wouldn't have got going as quick quickly as we did so it I, wouldn't have tested you and you, you yeah. wouldn't have had to respond perhaps with exactly. such urgency yeah exactly um what does the future look like you for you because you you I think are the first uh pioneer that we've spoken to who hasn't sold their business mm. so what's the future for you well I I think you know as I said there's so much opportunity that we can see within proper corn um, you know I think the brand can stretch outside of popcorn mm -hmm. we're in 10 countries across Europe now but you know what does further afield look like um, it's really important that we um, when we look back on this business that there's a legacy that we're proud of so um, creating a foundation is something that mm -hmm. really excites myself and Ryan so um, at the moment there's enough to keep us busy uh, for the time being. So what does success look like? If you did kind of, if you could project another five or maybe even 10 years down the line, what does success look like? You've mentioned the foundation, but in terms of the business? Um, I think, you know, being a, a global healthy snacking company that continually delivers taste and health. Um, that's kind of, you know, simply from a product perspective. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of a brand, um, a brand that, I don't know, maybe uh, peers and other companies reference as, a, as an example yep. of, of what a successful brand should be about. Um, and then on kind of the, the people side, um, continue to, to develop and nurture amazing talent who go on to create their own businesses or whatever, whatever their, wherever their passions lie. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then, you know, I, I'm not going to um, shy away from the fact that, you know, I want to be personally um, in a financially really secure position. I feel like there's more that I want to do with my life in terms of giving back and yep. getting involved in other ventures and other 
sort of maybe more charitable passions and um I guess success can is, is kind of a useful can facilitate. Yeah, yeah. success is useful. Would that philanthropy, do you think, in be in the in the entrepreneur uh, with other entrepreneurs, mm. helping them, as you've already mentioned, or are you thinking about something mm. perhaps broader? Well, um, um, you know, something that I'm really passionate about is the role of creativity, um, uh, and, and when I mean that. When I talk about creativity, I mean, you know, the ability to think differently. Mm -hmm. And um, increasingly, there's so many cuts um, to the arts in education. And I think that if we look to a future that is more uncertain than ever before, uh, you know, we can't rely on the blueprint anymore. How do we nurture creativity in the young, mm -hmm. um, particularly in more deprived, um, I guess, areas, um, so that... Um, children can grow up thinking uh, I guess yeah thinking more laterally um, but also being able to kind of develop themselves more you know men mental health um, is I think the next epidemic and so the creativity can play such a um, fundamental role in building both sides of, of that a bit of resilience yeah yeah I mean certainly it seemed to work for you uh, able to come up with an idea like proper corn on the on the back of a lot of things, but that gift from your father. Ah, uh, thank you. I mean, what what would your father say if he saw you now? Um, I don't know. I mean, I I um, I, I hope he'd be proud. Um, I'd just be so happy to see him. Yes, <laughs> I understand that. So we've talked business for almost an hour, but I, I want to find out a little bit more about the real you. So we have. Uh, Stolen a pop fire quiz format, and, and here it comes. Are you, are oh you ready God, for this? Okay. It's nice and easy, I promise. <laughs> uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, artist. See, now this always makes me want to ask more questions. Yeah. It's not how this works. <laughs> right, I must move on. Uh, which business or company, apart from your own, do you wish you'd founded? Um, God, there's so many. Uh, Patagonia. Uh, Rafa, I think, is amazing. Yes, we've, uh, we've actually spoken to that pioneer, yeah. Yeah, am amazing brand. Um, trying to think. I mean, Fever Tree, incredible success story. Yes, uh, can't be the gin and tonic. Uh, I'm trying to th not think of the obvious ones. Uh, is that's that a, enough? That's is a that good enough? three. No, yeah. that's a good three. So, who's your hero? My mum. <laughs> uh, since I would answer the, the question the same way, that is a totally acceptable answer. OK. <laughs> uh, what's your favourite word? Um, insatiable. There's, there's, there's just so many places you can go with that. <laughs> um, uh, what's your least favourite word? Can't. Your biggest fault? Um, bit controlling. I love the uh, I, love, I love the contrast. A bit controlling. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> what's your idea of happiness? Uh, I think probably contentment. Just you know, maybe finding a, a bit of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. uh, what keeps you awake at night? Uh, everything. I, I, I suffer with insomnia. I'm an awful sleeper. See, there's that work-life balance yeah. you're, not, you're not following yeah. through again. Yeah. Uh, what's your favourite swear word? I love this question. And you can say it. Just good old fuck. Yep, nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice, excellent. And if heaven exists, what would you like God to say when you arrive? Well, I'd probably say... Um, well, I think he'd say, surprise! <laughs> I mean, uh... <laughs> surprise! As in, well, as in, as in he was expecting you, to... Yeah, oh, you no. exist. Um, yeah, I, 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 maybe sadly I don't believe in God, so... Um... So uh, we, I think we have to at least go back a little bit to uh, insatiable. <laughs> no, God. Uh, I think um, just that constant, you know, appetite for, mm -hmm. for more... Uh, it's also a great Prince track, 
and I think I sort of first discovered that word through prints and I didn't really understand what it meant and I just loved the sound of it. See, and people say uh, art has no purpose and yeah. there it is, teaching us long words. So a bit of that, I think. No, that's brilliant. And also the, the idea that can't is your least favourite word. Is that, a, is that a contrivance or really for you being told that you can't do something is... Yeah, I just think that there's always a way around everything. You know, might not get to exactly the same end point, but I don't know. No, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. It's <laughs> been fascinating. You. That's it for Pioneers. My thanks to uh, Cassandra Stavrou. Don't forget you can download every episode of the show and all of Joe's audio offerings from your usual podcast providers. Leave us a review if you'd be so kind, and we'll speak to you next week. You've been watching Pioneers together with open money. Manage it, save it, invest it.